Uh, great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, taking time of your days to join us for lunch and uh, the sort of lunch and learn session. Uh, uh, as I think most of you are aware, uh, the towns of Arlington, uh, Belmont, and Winchester are all working with MassCEC and the Department of Energy Resources on uh, the HeatSmart Mass program, which is aiming to promote uh, clean heating and cooling technologies, including air source heat pumps, to residents and local businesses. Um, sort of became clear we wanted to do, you know, I, I know that heat pump has either a, uh, invokes a, a what reaction or a why are we doing heat pumps here uh, in, in Massachusetts reaction. Uh, so uh, uh, Ken invited us to, uh, or rather Ken and Ben from Belmont, and we sort of put together a bit of a collaboration to uh, host this event. Uh, so what uh, we're going to do is, is walk through a few different uh, items here. Uh, folks see OK in the back, or hear me all right? Um, so I think just, just we'll do a very, very brief level setting, sort of make sure everybody knows what we're talking about when we're, we're talking about heat pumps here uh, for this uh, called myth busting session. Uh, we'll talk about sort of what the lay of the land has been and what it, I guess, currently is in much of the rest of the country. Uh, we'll then talk about some of the new market development, new market and technological developments uh, that have occurred over the last decade uh, that have made heat pumps uh, a very uh, rapidly growing and important part of the uh, of the energy uh, I guess energy economy in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, we'll then talk as well as, as some of those market development goals, uh, both from the state and from utilities that are helping to drive this transformation and, and will uh, continue to make heat pumps a part of uh, home, uh, of energy consumption in homes and buildings. Uh, I'll then pass it over to my colleague, uh, Ari Jackson, uh, who uh, participated in, <coughs> in a uh, in-field evaluation study that was conducted from 2015 to 2016 uh, that mon monitored the performance of over 100 of, of these heat pump systems in Mass and Rhode Island, so he can tell you more about how they actually perform in the field uh, based on the study that uh, he completed for Mass Save. Uh, and then I'll just do kind of, kind of a brief recap where I'll walk through some of the common uh, statements that I've heard about heat pumps over uh, the last, um, I don't know, five years that I've been working on in, in this space and sort of talk about, you know, are they true, are they false, and how true or how false are they, and where, does, where is it actually, it depends. Um, actually, realize I didn't ne neglected to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jeremy Koo, I'm with the Cadmus Group. Uh, I'm working with uh, MassCEC as the, uh, providing technical assistance to the Heat Smart Mass program. Uh, Cadmus is an international energy consulting firm uh, headquartered here in the uh, somewhere between Waltham and Boston, uh, with offices around the country, and so we have worked with uh, everyone from MassCC and DOER to utilities like uh, you know, National Grid, um, Eversource, and then across the country in, in areas uh, related to air source heat pumps. Um, one other thing, uh, after, we're, I'll try to, try to keep the presentation to less than half an hour. Uh, there are other folks in the room, uh, including installers of the technology that will sort of have a, a robust Q&A panel with after the uh, presentation is done. So uh, I'd ask you to just kind of save your questions until then and we'll, we'll sort of uh, stick around as long as, as long as needed to, to answer your questions. Um, just a 30 second summary on sort of, you know, how a heat pump works, uh, or what a heat pump is. The best way I think to describe it is it's basically an air conditioner uh, that can run in reverse. Your typical air conditioner is using this refrigeration process uh, you know, compressing it to uh, be high temperature so it'll release heat somewhere, <laughs> expanding it and condensing it to, uh, into liquid form where it's really cold to absorb heat from somewhere and then sort of working the cycle. Heat pump just adds a reversing valve to this so that the cycle can run uh, in both directions so you're able to provide both heating and cooling. Um, typically, I think traditionally, you know, most folks think of uh, kind of cent central heat pumps as kind of like central air conditioners, uh, this sort of kind of unitary uh, ducted system, um, which really can't tell the difference uh, in, in, in until you're close up. Um, and then there are uh, ductless models uh, that are increasingly popular and are really a big piece of what's been driving uh, the sort of this market, uh, market transformation in the making uh, in the Northeast. Um, so Heat pumps are really a mature and well-established technology, just not in New England. Um, about 128 million housing units in the, in the U.S. and 14 million of them uh, use central air source heat pumps. Of course, uh, you know, over 90% of them are in the South and the West. Uh, uh, some data from uh, the American Housing Survey, uh, you know, heat pumps traditionally are used, uh, you know, as, you know, uh, 
in homes where there's a much more mild climate, where there's a big need for dehumidification and cooling and less so uh, for heating. Uh, obviously, the opposite is true in New England. And so, um, you know, conventional heat pumps and electric heating are really not uh, well made for New England winters. Um, anybody who's lived in a home with electric resistance baseboard can attest to that. Uh, conventional heat pumps really don't perform well in colder temperatures. Uh, the heating output and the efficiency of these systems decline substantially once you get towards, towards freezing, which it, it is very frequently here. Uh, these systems then rely on electric resistance backup uh, that is either built in the unit or uh, part, uh, put into the, into the uh, uh, fan coil to meet the load uh, in homes. Um, and so in Massachusetts, if you're using a conventional heat pump and uh, you know, you're frequently well below freezing you know, in the teens, uh, you, you know, this heat pump might not be much more efficient than electric resistance for much of the winter. Um, the other thing that has been a bit of a challenge for heat pumps is that the efficiency ratings that are standardized uh, and used uh, nationwide, uh, in particular heating seasonal performance factor, is not uh, really reflective of uh, climate zones, uh, the climate zone uh, that we are in. Uh, they, own, they test at 47 degrees and at 17 degrees and nothing else, and they assume at 17 degrees you're using electric resistance to meet the load. So not really what we want to be uh, encouraging. So it's really, it's not inaccurate to say that, or say, you know, uh, unfair to say that conventional heat pumps don't work well in New England. It is kind of a well-earned rep reputation. Uh, so what changed uh, is, of course, the, the big question. Um, the first thing was that over the course of the last, uh, last uh, decade or more, a lot of uh, ductless models with uh, kind of inverter-driven variable speed compressors started entering the U.S. market um, from, uh, from a lot of East Asian, in particular East Asian manufacturers. Uh, in uh, East Asian countries, Korea, Japan, et cetera, uh, heat pumps, are, or in particular these ductless systems, uh, refrigerant-based systems, are the default uh, for heating and cooling. Uh, and cities like Seoul uh, have, uh, actually I think Seoul has the same design temperature as, as Boston's, like 11 for 99% and uh, seven for 99.6. So uh, these systems are, you know, are very efficient and, and end up being the uh, primary sources of heating and cooling in homes and in, and in commercial buildings in, in East Asia. And so a lot of these manufacturers were, uh, were claiming that the, you know, these systems could provide the capacity and the efficiency at temperatures that uh, we had not seen uh, with the conventional heat pumps, uh, and uh, market, markets were starting to accelerate. Uh, Maine uh, began piloting, in particular, a program that pushed a lot of these ductless heat pumps that were uh, aimed at cold climate performance with a pilot program that started in 2012. It was very successful, and they, and they ramped up from there. So what that, what that drove was that in 2014, uh, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, one of the uh, five, right? No, six regional energy efficiency organizations around the country that are partially funded by DOE uh, established uh, what was called the Coal Climate Air Source Heat Pump Specification. As I mentioned, the standard uh, test, uh, test metric, efficiency metrics, and test procedures for heat pumps are really designed for um, climate, you know, cl I think climate zone four, so really up around here and not up here. And so uh, what they wanted to do was add sort of an extra element to it, which was actually have getting test data from manufacturers or labs uh, for performance at five degrees Fahrenheit, which is a much more reasonable temperature to test around for, uh, for folks in New England. Uh, so what that specification uh, established uh, for something to be considered a cold climate air source heat pump was, in addition to a few other things, the main, main, uh, main aspects of that specification are that they needed the, uh, any systems submitted need to demonstrate that they can per perform at five degrees Fahrenheit at uh, a COP or coefficient of performance of greater than 1.75. Um, another way to think about that is it needs to be at least 75% more efficient than electric baseboard heating at five degrees to be able to be uh, called a cold climate air source heat pump and several uh, tests in at higher than 1.75. Uh, these systems also needed to be Energy Star certified. Uh, initially, they don't they don't anymore. Uh, and also, have, you know, while HSPF was flawed, they still you know a lot of uh, systems in the market uh, were kind of at the higher end of that as well. The other piece they adop adopted was uh, requiring that uh, these systems have a variable speed or variable capacity com uh, output. Uh, in part because you know the the gap between uh, where our design temperatures are, where the extremes are in, in New England, and where we actually spend the majority of our heating 
heating hours uh, in a year means that systems that are sized for the peak are actually going to be spending most of their time at partial load. And so uh, if, we're, if our goal is efficiency, proper cold climate performance, we want systems that can modulate and run at partial load as opposed to cycling, which will uh, increase the efficiency penalty. Um, I was followed up then in 2015, uh, Mass CEC, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, established the Clean Heat and Cooling uh, Rebate Program uh, for air source, cold climate air source heat pumps in addition to other technologies like ground source heat pumps, solar hot water, and modern wood heating. Uh, so Mass CEC then added an additional requirement on top of the NEEP certification for its air source heat pumps, which is that not only do they have to be COP of 1.75 or greater at five degrees, they also have to meet the rated capacity at five degrees as well. Um, and there are a number of reasons why that's uh, beneficial. Certainly, you know, here in Eastern Mass, most design temperatures are not, are, are at or above five degrees. And so, si you know, it, it allows you to actually properly size the system down at, at five degrees. Also, the goal was to start moving the market more, more and more towards uh, these systems being able to serve as a, whole, as a sole source of heating as a whole, whole home system. So, the, so um, whereas a lot of, uh, still some of the cold climate ducted systems have some more difficulty uh, meeting that 100% of rated capacity. Uh, in 2018, uh, the Department of Energy Resources then uh, finalized regulations uh, for the uh, alternative portfolio standard. Uh, I won't go into that in great detail, but if you're familiar with the state renewable portfolio standard, it's a parallel uh, standard that focuses on um, sort of not, n not on renewable electricity generation, but on sort of alternative energy, uh, which covers a wide range of, range of things. And uh, they added some additional requirements on top of that as well, which was to push that uh, minimum efficiency at five degrees to 1.9 or greater. And also systems uh, qualifying for this would need to be pretty much designed to be the sole source of heating in the home. Um, and it brings us to sort of where, where I think uh, uh, one of the most significant developments uh, in the Massachusetts market uh, to date, which is uh, the new three-year plan that was uh, filed by MassSave or, um, and, and approved in January, uh, formally integrates coal climate heat pumps into the state's three-year efficiency plan for 2019 to 2021, which created targets for utilities, uh, dem you know, increased sort of the range of savings that could be captured, um, and uh, very importantly for market development efforts, really cranked up the rebates that are available for the technology. So um, all this has sort of brought us to where we are today, where heat pumps are really uh, a huge part of, uh, of uh, sort of the, ch the changing face of, uh, of, you know, particularly residential and small commercial HVAC markets. Um, so where are we today with cold climate heat pumps? Uh, you know, the NEEP specification initially uh, was primarily compo uh, uh, composed of those uh, ductless systems that East Asian manufacturers had brought in, but over time, more and more uh, investment from uh, uh, central, the central heat pump manufacturers uh, based in the US, American Standard, Train, Carrier, uh, these folks uh, started to really increase the number of ducted models that are available. And so as of February 2019, there were over 1,400 AHRI certified uh, models that were recognized by NEEP as cold climate. So, you know, exactly how quickly is this market developing? Uh, well, if, if the concern is how well these uh, systems perform in, in cold weather, um, Maine's a great place to take a look at exactly how well these are performing. Uh, Maine was one of the uh, first states to really throw uh, a, lot of, uh, um, a lot of investment uh, from their efficiency program into, uh, into heat pumps. They didn't actually require the cold climate specification, but when you look at what systems qualify, it's almost a, a complete overlap. Um, they've rebated about 30,000 30, systems between when they launched the program in 2013 to 2018. Um, Mass CEC's rebate program for air source, which closed uh, in March of, uh, uh, mostly closed in March of, uh, of this year, uh, had uh, rebated about 19,000 homes uh, at the time. That's uh, parallel to and with some overlap from uh, what Mass Save had rebated at that point, but the data is a little fuzzier on that front. Efficiency Vermont, similarly, uh, I didn't, wasn't able to find their 2018 data, but I know that actually it, it started taking off even faster after 2017. Um, and New York State also entered, uh, entered the uh, cold climate heat pump uh, rebate space, and in their first year, they, they also rebated about 4,000 systems. So there's really a lot of activity around the Northeast, in particular, on this space. It's becoming a very important part of state and utility energy goals. Um, so. Uh, 
again, I, I mentioned this, that uh, one of the ma biggest changes in the new three-year plan with, uh, through MassSave was sort of the switch into an energy optimization approach across the state. So not just sort of exclusive to now electricity savings and gas savings now, uh, there's sort of also a total energy savings uh, for the entire state. And so what that en has enabled is for heat pumps to be promoted to uh, customers uh, on a fuel neutral basis as assuming that it's, 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 a, um, it's an appropriate and cost effective solution for that, for that home. Um, the the, um, the, uh, the uh, utilities uh, participating in MassSave uh, set a target of installing 62,000 cold climate heat pumps in the next three years with the sort of breakout between residential, small commercial, and, and income eligible households. So this represents a you know, pretty substantial scale up and I think is represented by what we saw in the change in rebates uh, from what was a you know, few hundred dollars uh, per unit in the past to now. Um, as, as much as $1,600 uh, per ton of capacity. Um, and another important piece of that is that, you know, the mass safe home energy systems that folks receive uh, will, you know, folks will start being able to receive information about cold climate heat pumps regardless of what uh, existing fuel they have if it's, if it's appropriate and cost effective. Um, it's not just mass that's actually looking at this. New York State uh, at the same time, kind of in parallel, adopted uh, the New York, New York Public uh, Service Commission uh, uh, passed a new, uh, announced a new order in December of last year that also set sort of this total energy reduction target for the entire state of which um, five TVTUs are roughly 83,000 of those, uh, 83,000 heat pumps uh, need to be part of uh, their goals from 2021 to 2025. So um, again, really, really tr there's a lot of, uh, I think, market acceleration going on right now uh, in the Northeast. Obviously, you know, none of this matters if the technologies don't perform like folks expect. And so I'm going to pass it over to uh, my colleague Ari now. He'll talk about uh, the work that he did in, in uh, monitoring these systems in mass. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, my name's Ari Jackson. I work for the Cadmus Group. And a couple of years ago in 2015 and 2016, I was involved in a large scale study of, of ductless heat pumps in Mass and Rhode Island. So some background about the study, we, we've visited 150 homes and we collected three primary types of data. The first was looking at system performance and then we also surveyed homeowners and collected different attributes about the homes. Uh, our, what we were looking at mainly were energy and power savings, but then also trying to look specifically at cold climate systems compared to non-cold climate systems and then also looking at sizing and infield performance compared to manufacturer's ratings. Uh, to give you a sense of how we were collecting performance data, we have this, this diagram. Um, and what it's showing is that uh, we installed data logging devices for a period of one and a half years to two years, uh, measuring the electric consumption on the outdoor unit and also the, the thermal output, so the, uh, the heating or cooling delivered by the indoor unit. And comparing the, the input to the output, that's how we calculate efficiency. So using, using the d that data collected over um, about a year and a half, we, we made several plots, this being one of them. Um, this graph is showing uh, efficiency on the vertical axis and outdoor air temperature on the horizontal axis. And then it's splitting out the average performance of cold climate and non-cold climate systems. And for reference, uh, if you were to add a, uh, a line for electric resistance heating, um, that would be, it would be at one. Um, so below, below the heat pumps for, for all temperatures. Uh, so what we're looking at with this graph is, is one, the, the decreasing performance with lower outdoor air temperature four heat pumps during the winter, during the heating season. Um, and then also observing that there are, there are significant differences between the average performance of cold climate and non-cold climate systems. But for context, um, we've also included the, the average ratings, uh, the average heat, uh, HSPF values um, for each of those groups of systems. And what we find is that this, you know, when you account for this variable, it does explain a lot of the, a lot of the difference in performance um, between the two sets of systems. Another, uh, another analysis that we did was looking specifically at um, 
for homeowners that have installed a, a heat pump, when, uh, when it's favorable for them to use that heat pump in place of, say, a boiler or a furnace or whatever system they have installed. Um, so the variables that we consider in that analysis are the, the cost, the system efficiencies, the cost of electricity versus, say, oil or natural gas, and then as we saw previously, because of the temperature, the efficiency of a heat pump decreases with temperature, we also have to consider the outdoor air temperature. Um, so what we did is we calculated what we call the breakpoint temperature, which is where a, uh, a heat pump and an alternative system are equally cost effective to he for heating a space, and plotted that over a range of um, resource costs. So here we have the cost of electricity on the horizontal axis and the cost of oil on the vertical axis. And what we find then is that looking at the different, uh, the different prices that we observed in 2015 and 2016, we can see that the, the breakpoint temperature, um, depending on these prices for a heat pump, was between 5 and 25 degrees. And so how we would interpret that is to say that uh, for temperatures lower than that, it would be more cost effective for a homeowner to heat an indoor space with their, in this case, a boiler. Um, but for temperatures higher than that, you would be saving money to use a heat pump. Um, so then the other consideration we had here is uh, looking at the number of hours uh, at each temperature that are really typically observed uh, in, in this climate, in Massachusetts. And so we overlaid the, you know, the number of hours at each temperature. And what we see is that there aren't too many hours um, below 10 degrees, you know, a few more below 20, but um, the way we interpret it is if, if there's a small number of hours where you're not, save, you know, uh, spending a little more to use a heat pump, it's not a huge difference if, if over the course of the season um, you're generally saving money. Uh, so some primary findings from the study um, that are at least relevant to this discussion uh, is that we did find higher performance in cold climate systems. Uh, part of this did correlate with the higher ratings of those systems. Um, we also did find that they, you know, when sized correctly, the, the systems are performing at low temperatures. And then we also had some just kind of common sense takeaways to, for homeowners to increase their performance, which were looking at things like, or making sure there's ample space around the indoor and outdoor units since they're taking in air. Um, also changing the air filters. We did observe a number of cases where this was reducing performance and protecting against things like getting covered in snow or if there are prevailing winds. These can all detract from system performance. Uh, so I'll hand it back to Jeremy and he's going to discuss uh, some common questions that we get about, about these systems. Great, thanks Ari. Um, and then one other thing I'll add to that last point, I think it doesn't, doesn't show up here that, you know, it, it's, it's not to, I think, minimize that uh, these systems, like, like others, it is very important to make sure that they are uh, installed properly, that they are, you know, with heat pumps as opposed to, you know, boilers and furnaces where you have very large systems as, you know, the smallest system available. You know, I, I think I have like a uh, five, ton, five ton furnace in a, you know, 1,000 square foot apartment um, in that, that I live in as the smallest size that I think was available for that. You know, heat pumps, you actually do really want to right size of the space. and so. Uh, there's a little bit, I think, of uh, um, uh, definitely a bit of a learning curve sort of in, change in how uh, pra insulation practices have needed to evolve with these technologies, and, and uh, I think a little, you know, more and more of the folks are learning day by day. So while we s certainly have seen uh, that these systems perform very well, I think already there was one thing in the, uh, one uh, thing that was noted in the study, there was one installer that uh, had done a substantial number of systems that were measured uh, in the study, uh, and their systems performed substantially worse, uh, you know, as much as 40% worse uh, than the average for all the other installers. So definitely, to, and you know, that, that I, I seem to recall from the study that it included some things like the, 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 the uh, um, uh, Ari, Ari and his team didn't look at sort of all the specific things that were being done wrong, but they could just see from the eye test that it wasn't, it totally did not even pass the eye test and so some of the practices that these folks were following. So it definitely is very important to, to, uh, to have installers that are following sort of all, all of the best practices. So um, here's sort of a list of, I think, some of the uh, uh, statements that I've heard one way or another about heat pumps uh, over the last few years, and I'll just kind of go through these really quickly. Um, so obviously the biggest one, heat pumps don't work in New England climate. I think we've, I th 
demonstrated that you know cold climate heat pumps can be very efficient uh, at you know two five degrees and uh, and can con continue to operate uh, down in a of thirteen negative fifteen. That's just what they're rated to. I've seen videos of. Uh, and I don't know why this person was outdoors, uh, somebody who was out in Chicago when it was negative 25 uh, earlier this winter, uh, pointing to his heat pump that was working. So, um, but not officially what they're rated to. Obviously, as, as Ari pointed out, there is, you know, efficiency and capacity does still decline at lower temperatures. Uh, but, you know, certainly here in the, in the Boston area, uh, you know, we, we, you know, typical year, uh, so what, 36 hours below 7 degrees Fahrenheit. So that pretty much all of this is, uh, is covered. Um, and you know, in, s in some cases, depending, you know, particularly if you're in uh, further west in the state or further north, uh, you may need a backup system. Uh, also, as Ari said, depend, you know, operating that backup system can be more or less cost effective depending on what fuel prices look like. Um, so heat pumps are more expensive than their conventional alternatives. This is mostly true. Um, cold climate heat pumps are typically more expensive to install up front than, uh, than a boiler furnace or central AC system. They can often be, can often be cheaper, uh, particularly new construction or major renovations when uh, uh, they're being installed as a sole source of heating or cooling, particularly with some of these systems. You, could skip, you can skip installing sheet metal if you wanted to uh, as part of that. Um, and also, you know, if you add in the cost of replacing a furnace and a central AC at the same time, uh, a heat pump can, can potentially serve as, a, you know, be equivalent or, or not, or a much smaller incremental cost. Um, obviously, there are a lot of incentives that are, that are available. Um, you know, a, a larger heat pump system installed through mass save that's offsetting oil or propane uh, today could be receiving rebates, you know, as much as $6,000 in rebates so, or, or more. So it's fairly substantial now. Um, heat pumps don't save folks money. Uh, the answer to that one is really it depends. Uh, I think energy prices are really uh, the major factor here. Um, under today's energy prices, uh, which obviously uh, with you know, fossil fuel prices, we've seen them fluctuate a lot, in particular over the last five years. Um, they're always cheaper to operate than propane and electric resistance. Uh, they are cheaper than oil until, you know, the temperature depends, again, on the system type and what the fuels are, but, uh, you know, and for most of, for most of, the, most of the winter. Um, they are more expensive than gas uh, under the current high electricity, low gas prices, uh, though there are, <coughs> certainly if you're using solar PV, uh, it can be cheaper than gas or usually is cheaper than gas depending on what you're paying for that uh, solar electricity. And um, there are some municipal utilities uh, where, you know, like uh, one of the other heat smart communities uh, in Hudson Stowe, uh, where their average residential rate is about 10 and a half cents a kilowatt hour, and that brings uh, heat pumps substantially lower in cost uh, to natural gas in those communities. Um, and there's also some limited potential for cooling savings, just because these systems tend to be, um, you know, the cold climate systems tend to be kind of at the top, top of the line and as far as efficiency goes. Uh, but we've seen that some folks, when they're given a nice, quiet, efficient uh, cooling system, tend to use a lot more of it than, uh, than an otherwise uh, kind of you know, annoying uh, window unit. Uh, how much exactly is this the case? Well, just pulling kind of 2018 to 2019 fuel costs, looking at about uh, 149 a therm, 315 a gallon for oil, 306 a gallon, uh, figures from, from uh, DOER and EIA. And then looking at 22 cents a kilowatt hour for uh, Eversource and Grid, uh, 19 uh, for Belmont Light. And for PV, if you looked at it as like an LCOE or a, a PPA cost of 12 cents a kilowatt hour, um, this is more or less what you look you, you end up looking at. Um, the actual, you know, this is this is I take a you know use the coefficient of performance of 2.5 for an air source heat pump. So certainly that's actually a lower figure than what was shown in uh, uh, that Ari that in in the study that Ari conducted. Um, I think the seasonal COP that was seen for those systems was closer to, to uh, 3.2. So that would drastically change the costs uh, that are here. Um, but I use 2.5, one, to be conservative and also to re reflect potentially larger systems. Why is the air source solar PV zero? Uh, it's cost. Uh, well, because you're paying, for the, you're paying for the solar at some point or another. So uh, I'm using a, a 12 cents a kilowatt hour as a levelized cost of energy or a uh, power purchase agreement price. So obviously once, you know, this is not to say sort of like annual operating costs if, you know, the electricity's powering the heat pump from PV is totally free, but you did pay for it at some point or another. So it's more looking at what's the lifetime cost of electric, equivalent cost of electricity. Um, 
Heat pumps don't actually reduce emissions because our grid isn't clean. Uh, that's one I've heard a lot. Um, it, that, that, is, uh, that is false uh, under today's, uh, today's um, ISA New England grid mix. Um, we see today, under today's uh, grid mix though, I, I caveat that I'm curious to see where it changes after, um, after the Pilgrim closure. Uh, but uh, today, under today's grid mix, at least under last year's emissions figures, uh, heat pumps will reduce emissions compared to natural gas. Um, how much, uh, again, using, using those same, that same COP, uh, you know, uh, under today, you know, a, a system emissions of about 682 pounds per megawatt hour, uh, we see a fairly substantial reduction for our air source uh, from natural gas uh, as, as far as emissions go. And certainly for anybody that's, again, using an on-site PV or uh, Belmont Light is approaching 50% renewable electricity, uh, that's going to go down uh, even more. Whereas, you know, if we talk, we can, you know, it's not to say that building energy efficiency is not critical to reducing emissions, but uh, there's a limit to what we can do to, the, to some of the emissions of the fuels that are uh, being burned. And whereas as Massachusetts's grid uh, continues to become increasingly zero emissions, uh, that will continue to decline. Well, you know, Jeremy, if somebody likes to do 100% renewable electricity, that kind of knocks it down to zero. Yeah, I mean, in theory, yeah, uh, definitely. It, it's, uh, yeah, there, there's, uh, you know, Hudson Light and Power's uh, generation is, I think, 93% uh, nuclear or renewable, and so there, there's, theirs is a sliver, effectively. Um, heat pumps are more difficult for customers to operate. This is a partially true, partially false. I think it may be better phrased as uh, using a heat pump requires a little bit of customer change, uh, uh, customer behavior change uh, to max get the most out of the system. Certainly, you know, those central ducted systems operate pretty much as standard central heating, heating systems, and so uh, there's really not much to change there. This really applies more to the ductless systems because for most folks, you're moving from a central system to uh, what is a zoned system, and so those individual units, uh, there's some aspects like uh, heat pumps don't uh, set back as well as fossil fuel systems because they take longer uh, to uh, come back up to temperature. Uh, so encouraging folks who are you know, used to really setting back their systems every time they leave the home or at night uh, to minimize that, to maximize the efficiency uh, is one major aspect that, that uh, has affected uh, how these systems perform. Obviously, you know, cleaning filters more frequently uh, is one that, one that uh, uh, folks uh, tend to never be as good about doing. Um, I think one of the major things that I think recognition of uh, some of these uh, behavior change uh, challenges, uh, mass saves larger incentives that are available uh, in 2019 encourage the use of integrated uh, software and hardware controls that allow the heat pump to work with the existing system if it's installed in that capacity uh, so that um, it really takes a lot of the, uh, any of the manual elements uh, out of that so that you know, the systems can be working, working together. Um, the other one is, you know, heat pumps can't serve as a sole source of heat in the home. And I, I say it depends um, just because, you know, I, in, in fairness to, you know, looking at the Northeast and Massachusetts as a whole, um, it is absolutely very common that we see now that heat pumps are being installed as a sole source of uh, heat, heating and cooling uh, in new construction and renovation projects. This is uh, a, um, you know, a particular area where uh, this sort of uh, sole, whole home system approach has seen uh, really, really, really big changes over the last few years. Um, most of the systems that have been installed in retrofits are being installed as a supplemental system or using the existing system as backup, but there are still many whole home systems. We have multiple Arlington residents uh, here um, at our, at our kick, Heat Smart Arlington, Winche Arlington Winchester kickoff event about eight weeks ago who have installed uh, uh, heat pumps in their existing homes and not in super tight homes or homes that have gone through deep energy retrofits. So it's absolutely very doable, um, in, um, particularly in, in this, this part of the state. Um, it can be a little bit more challenging uh, with the homes very leaky, uh, just due to sizing, some sizing constraints and also in just areas with, uh, uh, with colder climates uh, than Eastern Mass. Obviously, once you start getting into um, further north or into parts of Central and Western Mass, uh, it, it kind of can be inadvisable uh, given the colder temperatures to use them as a sole source. But still, there are plenty of homes in, in Vermont that I've seen where you know, you're using the heat pump for 90 five plus percent of the heating and then using, using a backup for the remainder of the time. So I guess in summary, you know, I, I want to emphasize, you know, heat pump, we're not trying to say that heat pump is always the best option for every customer. They are not 
necessarily always the best option in every home, uh, but they are a very viable option uh, for many New England homes, and I, th I think increasingly one of the most many uh, important elements of achieving Massachusetts's state uh, energy and emissions goals. Um, I'll leave with just with this one here that you know, if we're trying to get to 80 by 50 as uh, you know obligated under the Global Warming Solutions Act, uh, we have to do something about the 20 percent, 7 percent of emissions that are uh, related to space and water heating, and heat pumps can be a pretty important part of that equation. So that's it for, for slides. I want to invite as well sort of anybody from the HeSmart teams who want to come up and sort of be part of the Q&A panel, as well as I think uh, uh, Jeff uh, Noel from Muirfield Mechanical, who's one of the uh, uh, heat, uh, heat Smart selected installers for the town of Belmont, Muirfield's one of the larger installers of uh, cold climate air source heat pumps in the state has installed hundreds of these every year and so uh, can also answer any questions that you have. <laughs> questions? Any, any, any questions that can be about this or about the content or just anything else related to heat pump? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which has currently has natural gas heating. Mm -hmm. The plant is relatively new. Mm -hmm. It has a high velocity ducted air, central air system. Mm -hmm. Is there any potential for making a heat pump part of that? Or as supplemental? Or do you wait to replace everything? Or uh, how you much know, redundancy usually is there in the ducting and all of that? Yeah, I mean, you know, with the, obviously you'd, you'd want to sort of ensure that, it, it, you know, the ductwork would work for whatever model that you're putting in. I think one of the main things is obviously, I think, you know, I, I'm not going to say that, you know, uh, it's going to be particularly cost effective to do so. Uh, one option that we've seen uh, can be can be potentially viable option for folks who have uh, gas homes is that, you know, if you wait until like the central AC dies, uh, the actual upcharge from going from a central AC to a central heat pump can be as little as, you know, $500 to $1,000. Um, so instead of replacing with a new central AC, you replace it with a central heat pump. You install controls that are set up to toggle between using one or the other uh, during the heating season. And then you let that heat pump operate at its most efficient, which, is in the, you know, uh, which would be sort of in the shoulder season. Um, and that would allow the heat pump to sort of be able to run at sort of it's peak efficiency and then switch very quickly over to gas when, that fur when the furnace becomes uh, a much the, the lower cost option. And then, if, and then if fuel prices change over time, you could change where that, where that switch over point is um, to, you know, so that you can keep uh, you know, using what, what's the more efficient system. So otherwise that heat pump is, it, it can, it's basically your central AC and then it'll do a little bit of shoulder season heating. You, you spent a lot of time on, heat, on a heat pump as a heating source, mm -hmm. but as an air conditioner, is it, is it significantly different from a, a modern central air system? No, no, it's, it, it really is. A, it's the only difference is that you, you, you have a reversing valve that runs it, runs it, you know, runs in reverse. Like all of the systems that Mass CEC was rebidding, they're all energy star rated cooling systems. So, so if you look at the NEEP specification, a lot of these, um, I'll pick on Mitsubishi for example, just because they're, they're, the, they have, they're one of the largest uh, ductless uh, manufacturers that are best represented in the ductless market in Massachusetts. Uh, their single and multi-zone systems range from about seven, 17 to 20, 25 SEER. Uh, 12.5 to 13 e, uh, EER, so uh, same level of efficiency as a lot of the uh, high efficiency air conditioning systems that are going in. I think the added benefit is that also um, now you're, you, because these cold climate systems need to be variable capacity, now you have variable capacity in the, in the cooling season as well. So that can provide um, superior dehumidification to allow the system to kind of run more constantly as opposed to, you know, I don't know, my, my, my AC right now is going on for five minutes and then off for 45 minutes <laughs> in this weather. Yes. Yeah, that's a somewhat related question. I, I happen to live in, in a condo development, the 54 units, each one's the same. Outside, it was built, it was all electric neighborhood. Mm -hmm. it had these two big old, like Carrier or some other brand, mm -hmm. air source heat pumps that run into the basement into a ducted system for the house. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, one thing I'm wondering is, do they make replacements for those big old outside units that are efficient to these, to these low temperatures, as opposed to, you know, we actually got a mini split installed 
separately from that. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, do they have something that's, that's as efficient as a mini split for those big old dual uh, heat pumps? I mean, I think like a typically 20 years old. Product. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is it like there's two of those serving each unit in the condo, or is each it? Apartment. Yeah. Each so apartment has its own. Like upstairs, downstairs, or something. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a, it's going to the same unit in the basement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I like I, I I would assume yes. It just sort of depends on what you know whether you have the right right pairing. Obviously, I think you know generally good practice to um, do some do some duct sealing for any older duct work uh, to make sure you're you're not wasting much heat. But I mean, Jeff, I bet you run into that situation yeah, all the I time. Kind of ducted heat pumps, which you get limited to on those, um, is you get limited to sizing. Um, so, whereas with a lot of conventional AC or non cold climate heat pumps, you can go anywhere from 1.5 tons to 5 tons when you tend to get into the cold climate. They don't have them in half ton increments and they either go three, four, or five tons. Um, so, if it's a smaller apartment complex, it would be kind of hard with those. Um, there are, now there's two manufacturers out that do it that can actually just replace just a coil and outdoor unit and not an actual air handler and still be cold climate. Um, so there are many applications that you could take into that. And when you have an inductless, you could also do a pairing, at least with us, because we install Mitsubishi, that you could do a partial inducted with a ductless application on it as well. Do, 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 do the uh, contractors, if somebody has one, like in our neighborhood, their system is failing and they've got to get the compressors, the outside compressors replaced, mm -hmm. Would they automatically be much more efficient, or do they still install old, inefficient ones? Or, or no, so I mean, they range anywhere from you can get 13 sear equipment still up to 21 to 25 sear for ducted. Um, the average that I see most contractors installing for central systems like that's around 16 <coughs> sear, um, which would be a secondary source. You're not going to be able to sole source heat with a heat pump at that rate. Um, you'd have to get to something like Carrier's Green Speed Models, one that we put in. Mitsubishi has a P series that we install as well. Um, but you have to be replacing at that point in time the indoor and outdoor unit, and that's kind of where bouncing off like what Jeremy said. What we can do is, is if you try and look at, you know, a high efficiency cold climate heat pump compared to a conventional system, the cost is almost double in most cases. Um, but if you look at that, your system's now died, and you were already going to spend that seven thousand if it was fourteen to get it in its hole. It, it's a cheaper upgrade to go to soul source, but you could also just upgrade from a sixteen CRAC to a heat pump and be able to come down to you know, your 35 or 40 and be able to still supplement with that. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a reasonable choice, either updating your existing system or getting separate uh, ductless heat exactly. pumps installed. Either, either way makes a certain degree of sense. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of options for mixing and matching. Yes? You mentioned that um, Massey was going to start modeling uh, the pumps in their recommendations for the mm -hmm. resorts. Uh, have you given, so I, I see one of the challenges is that um, the price uh, variability in, mm -hmm. um, as a, when a customer goes to get a quote, mm -hmm. it, can, it can differ drastically. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and then that, that causes confusion, right, to the mm -hmm. customer. Um, so do you know how MassSafe is handling that and has Cadmus given any thought into like some kind of pricing guidelines to kind of standardize the pricing? Yeah, on that, on that first point, I think I can't speak to that in detail just because it's, it's kind of emerging right now. Like, um, you know, went into effect in January, they start, you know, some of the uh, home performance contractors started getting kind of new training in this uh, over the course of the last month or two. So I haven't seen sort of like what has been the outcome and what, what you're actually seeing in the home energy, energy assessments at this point. Um, Maybe you can speak to that, yeah. So I'm happy to address that. Um, it, it is still in the planning uh, phase, but there's likely going to be uh, reference to Mass DEC's database of all of the installed pricing. Uh, with some range, we understand that giving um, a specific, this is going to cost X number of dollars, doesn't work for contractors, every home is different, all that stuff. So we use the actual install prices of tens of thousands of systems uh, to give a range of what to expect um, with some careful consideration not to upset contractors, which is easy to do. And, uh, when you give <laughs> no uh, when you give pricing. So um, I work for a company that runs a little portion of the NASA program. Um, so the, it's in development that that is likely to be. And on the latter, the, the second part of your question about have we given thought into that, one of the, one of the elements of the heat smart programs is that uh, the contractors that are participating, they, they bid in a sort of a base pricing 
I left sort of like the list of like this is what each model costs. These are this, these are the general prices. You know, obviously they can range a little bit for like the types of adders that are included. Like this is how much electrical subpanel upgrade might be. This is how much upgrading the indoor unit might be. This is if you put in a central air handler, etc. Uh, and all that's on, on the HeatSmart websites. Uh, so one of the goals is, you know, is some degree of tri pricing transparency. Uh, it's not as easy as, you know, you know, and with, you know, mass saves weatherization where all the pricing is standardized, um, uh, you know, down to the per foot basis um, or, you know, solar PV where, you know, you have like two or three different types of modules and everything and then, you know, a, a, a narrower uh, potential range for that. So, so I, it, it absolutely is, absolutely is definitely a challenge uh, in our experience in, in these sorts of outreach programs to really uh, set the right expectations for pricing. Um, we had one experience where, you, you know, we started listing all the prices and so obviously, you know, people naturally gravitate towards the lowest price and then they get their quotes and of course, you know, they want, like, they were like, I want a whole home system and so they're expecting to see 4,000, they get something that's more like 15,000 and um, so there's definitely been a lot of kind of evolution in how we're trying to think about presenting that information and setting the right expectations to folks so that it doesn't feel like, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, getting, getting shafted or, or um, there's some dishonesty going on. I think standardized pricing for single zones is pretty much straight across the board. I think you see it with most contractors, you know, they're 6, 9, 12, 15, and 18. Those are pretty much seven. If you're bound one there and eight feet below as a condenser, or it's 15 over, is there really a price difference? The guys are there, but, you know, they not it's in our business model for it. It's when getting to the whole home that it's so drastic. We did two neighbors' homes, and I mean, unit location is thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, I'm finding that more and more contractors are installing prices a lot more standardized than it used to be. Like going back five years ago, there was thousands of dollars in drastic, um, but definitely indoor model changes and locations. But I see across the board, pretty much single zone applications are pretty well standardized out there. Mm -hmm. I know that Massive did have to do, well, well not Massive specifically, but a lot of uh, PAs were looking at contractors that were asking for quotes to see what it was, so I think they could find a range. Um, I know we're working with other sources. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about any incentives that might be available? Um, the main, like the primary incentives right now uh, in the uh, mass safe territory are through the electric heating and cooling program at the residential scale. Um, those range from the low end, which is if you're just basically doing a central air conditioner replacement, I think it's like 50 to 150 per ton, or if you're displacing gas because they can't. Uh, yes. Uh, then there's there. I think they're still in the process of figuring out sort of how the uh, um, how that'll look at the commercial multifamily level. But CI definitely. Uh, I I it's I it, I think it's still under. They're still finalizing some of the numbers around it. I know there's uh, some uh, some sort of initial discounts that are fairly modest that are, I think are being built in at like the distribute you know supply distribution level uh, as sort of like uh, instant re you know instant discounts from. Uh, uh, from participating suppliers, but uh, you know, and obviously, then there's you know, uh, I think I think now uh, as well that since they can count, I think a broader range of energy savings, there'll be ways integrated into you know commercial new construction and, and multifamily programs. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it's me um, you mentioned about inefficiency of turning off a mini split and then turning it on again. Mm -hmm. And given what we do at home with the one mini split that we have in our living room, um, I wonder if we're doing the wrong thing. We, we tend to, in the evening, in the winter, mm -hmm. turn it off, we go to bed, I get up first in the morning, the house is pretty cold, I go downstairs, I turn it on, and, and you know, an hour or so later, things are okay. Mm -hmm. um, is that inefficient or is that just unpleasant? Uh, it's, it is inefficient. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is inefficient because uh, the thing about variable speed compressors is that they are more efficient when they're not working as hard. When they're working at max, they're not any, le any more efficient really than a single or, or dual stage compressor. Um, you'll actually note, note that, you know, uh, when you, if you were to look at like a brand new window unit, window AC unit you can buy today, you, you get EERs of close to 12, which is not all that far off from the 12 and a half, 13 that you see here. And that's because that, you know, ear is measuring sort of like a peak cooling condition. So if you think about it on the, wind, on the heating side of things, when you're firing that system back up at five in the morning, that's one of the coldest parts of the day. And so now that system's working 
at full to try to bring things back up to temperature. Uh, generally, we've seen that if you basically kind of just set it and let it just keep running at partial, that can be more efficient over the long run. And so that tends to be the guidance that is uh, mass save issues now, just this kind of set it and forget it. Um, yeah. Maybe if you turn it down like 10 degrees or something. Generally, you just don't want it, like the setback, if anything, should be very minor. Just because like, you know, it, it's, it, it, what, with, for, for a single zone, if you're, you know, mini split where you're trying to, if you're trying to just like heat up, you know, that main space it's in, it can be, can be okay, but when you've got a bigger system that's trying to bring the whole home back up to temperature, um, you know, you're looking at something that's going to increase the temperature, you know, you know, maybe a couple of degrees and, you know, a few degrees an hour as opposed to like much more quickly if you're, you know, blowing 100 something degree air. How about just on the phone the customers too looking at it? Are you looking at it from a comfort standpoint or a savings standpoint? You know, some people do like to sleep in a cooler temperature, then that would be fine. You're turning it down for a comfort savings, you know, to you. But if you're looking for a cost savings, and like my house, like I have a whole home key pump that I don't have any backup or anything in there. And in November, I'll turn it to 68 degrees. And in April, I'll turn it off. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's no touching it there. Same similar with my AC. You know, now that it's hot out, I'll turn it to 72 degrees and I'll turn that back off in September. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of educational wise of it too. Um, but if you're maybe not using the room, and that's where it gets confusing, a lot of these ductless companies have sold it as like a room to room, you can cool and heat each room individually, and if you're not using a room, turn it off. Well, that's not necessarily a good savings aspect. The equipment will allow you to do it, but that's not what it's designed for, really. Uh, yes? Just to follow up on this line, um, so Winchester installed many splits in one of our school administrative buildings, and uh, the idea was to do the shoulder season and the summer kind of thing. Um, and I was the person that was explained from the installer how to work it, and then I was to go in and talk to all the people who sit in the offices. And what I understood, what we passed on to them, was the idea that make sure you turn it off every day when you leave, because it costs money to run the electricity. So now I'm hearing that maybe that's not the most efficient way to go. So what what happens to and what everybody used to, you know, at least when I was growing up, it was, you know, you leave for work at 68, you know, and you, you turn it down to 60 and you go away, right. and that's going to be a big model savings, but what ends up happening is the whole heating load of the house is actually going to cool down throughout the day. So just for the sake of numbers, if your, your heat pump turned on and ran for 15 minutes for, eight, for every hour for the course of eight hours, okay, now we're only looking at two hours of runtime or you get home at three o'clock, you turn that on and it has to run for two and a half hours or even a similar two hours to bring the temperature back up. You're kind of splitting hairs there. Plus when it comes to AC, if they're running an AC, all the humidity is going to rise, the heat rises, and it's going to take that much longer to drop it out. Um, so, so definitely more efficient to be Part of more. my job is to look at their electricity use mm -hmm. month to month. Is there any way that we can tell like whether we're using them efficiently or not? <laughs> <laughs> not, not necessarily unless you were to really do like tracking. Yeah. Um, Ari. <laughs> uh, the only one. We can, Ari can figure out some way to do that, but it's more complicated than just looking at the bills, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think leaving, I mean, unless you're extended amounts of time, you know, vacation where they're gone for a week, you're talking a different scenario there, but if they're turning them off every night and then turning them back on for heating mainly, it's going to be more money. You just think about it this way, right? When I'm saying like you have to run it at max for it to like bring the temperature up very quickly, you're talking down here. For most of the winter, we're here. So, so realistically speaking, like that's half, the, you know, you're operating, operating at half the efficiency to, you know, when you, when you turn it off like that, when, it, when you're trying to bring it back uh, up. The whole, you know, the air conditioning part of it, is it the same idea? That's, I mean, in, generally, yes. I mean, you know, the temperature extremes, not, a, not, as, not as substantial. I think the main thing is, is definitely, like, if, if there's, you know, dehumidification is a concern. It's going to be comfort. Your cost for operating, I don't see that it's going to be any more or any less um, for AC turning it down. But what's going to end up happening is, is that unit can much easily, much easier take and drop the temperature in the room for cooling wise very rapidly, but that doesn't mean that the moisture is going to come out. So then you're going to create a cool damp climate and then that unit's going to basically shut off, but it's still going to feel humid like it does in here. Whereas if you left it on overnight, the humidity is going to stay out of the room, which means that they're going to be more comfortable at a higher temperature. So say from like May till October, when we get those random 95 degree days here and there, 
it might be better just to leave it on? I mean, I, I, I AC about 2,000 square feet with mine, um, and I have it set between 70 and 72. Um, and on average, the AC for my monthly bill is, is less than $20 for 2,000 square feet. Yeah, I think part of it is just like, you know, cooling, the amount, of, the amount of money you'd spend over the course of a season on cooling versus heating is, is just such that like, you could, there might be sort of very minimal differences in, uh, you know, if you're changing, you know, maybe 10%, 10 to 20% of the cooling bill, it's, it's in kind of not that, not all that significant, uh, sort of on an individual system basis. Uh, yes, and then here. It's a simplistic question. I've been in a family like how he pumps work in a lot of applications. Mm -hmm. We have a single family house mm -hmm. that's run on an efficient natural gas system that has forced out water. Mm -hmm. What are the, is, is it, it sounds like it could be the, the, the economics don't work. Not really. Uh, in most cases, not, re not really. Uh, from, from a, if you're using, just say, I'm going to replace that with, uh, with a heat pump, um, you know, just under under what you're paying from Eversource or Grid, no, it's not cost effective. You can say there is like, I think in my house your baseboard heat is going to heat up the whole house or large spaces at a time. Whereas in the fall, you're just chilly in one room. You want to you know, use that just spot on the yeah. off real quick. It's a so zone, zoning you got a whole new system. You can't use the forced out water system, <coughs> right? You need Right, then in that case, you'd probably be putting in a ductless system that's zoned and is using kind of blowing air from individual air handlers as opposed to using, integrating into the, the existing system. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, that's not to say folks aren't putting uh, ductless heat pumps into gas homes. I think something like about 30% of uh, the rebates mass CEC issued went to gas homes, but it's mostly for cooling or for zoning or for spot applications and that, you know, you, no, 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 nothing about air conditioning is cost effective. <laughs> Uh, this question on variable speed uh, compressors, mm -hmm. you know, relatively new, maybe has been a whole lot of time to prove them out, but have there been problems uh, showing up? No, Mitsubishi warranties them for 12 years. Um, they're, again, they're not, they're not, they're not, they're newer here. They're not new in the rest of the world. Uh, I think actually we found, we heard, uh, I was reading an article recently that uh, heat pumps are now uh, in new replacements are now the uh, plurality of uh, heating systems installed in Germany. Um, so, and in East Asia, there, there's the baseline. And even here, I guess, relatively new would be kind of like a perspective, you know, because they have had them out with variable speed. Or Mitsubishi, for the longest time, had digitally commutated, which was their version, or basically is variable speed, um, for a relatively long period now. Um, like Jeremy said, they do warranty them for 12 years, and then Mitsubishi now is the largest manufacturer of compressors. Does Mitsubishi warranty the labor right. as well? Uh, uh, you, can, you can purchase a labor warranty uh, through Mitsubishi. Yeah. Well, it's a. Uh, but even, even the outdoor 12 year labor warranty can come as cheap as nine hundred dollars. The problem is nine years after you have the thing installed, find the guy that installed it. But you can call any. It, the warranty is for Mitsubishi. No, I know, but usually your installed labor is twice the cost of the parts. Or oh yeah. Oh, well, that's, so, yeah, I agree. Yeah. So there, they have a 12 year Mitsubishi has a 12 year warranty plan that you can purchase through them, and you can hire any contractor. You can buy a contractor level pricing. That you could say, I want um, $85 an hour is my option, $135 is my option for whatever the compressor takes. And then you should pay the contractor out for that. So you have to actually go through that. And it's relatively inexpensive when you actually look at it. Um, I think most of their outdoor units range well, between $100 and $300. Yeah, no, but my point is that with Mitsubishi, and this goes for anybody that warranties their equipment, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of useless because it doesn't cover the cost of installing it, doesn't cover you know, the, the, the repair itself. Mm -hmm. So it's like three, you know, there are places under dollar compressor, it's gonna take you $600 yeah. to upgrade that. Which, yeah. is why, which is why I solely use Mitsubishi in a sense because we don't run into that, because, you know, me as a consumer or as a contractor, if I install something nine years later, I'm paying $1,200 or $1,300 to put in a free compressor, how free is the compressor now? Exactly. So I, have <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to go back, <laughs> in a sense, you know, no news would be as good news. So. Yeah. You know, and it, I, I think it also, you know, I, I, again, I think Jeff was saying Mitsubishi is manufacturing compressors for like everybody else at this point. A lot of the, a lot of the um, folks like American Standard and such, like they're pulling in inverter compressors from Mitsubishi to now be the variable speed, uh, you know, component behind their equipment. So, uh, you know, 
if you warranty that for 12 years and the system is expected to last 15 to 18, it's, it's, it's uh, I think, it's, yeah. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Any, <laughs> anyone, anyone else before I go back to Alan again? <laughs> yes. Um, touching on the refrigerant, so it's now what, 410? 410. 410? Okay. Um, where are we on the evolution of refrigerants? Uh, the EU, uh, California, Canada, and the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol will make them start phasing it out. So the next generation is, is going to need to be around the corner uh, very soon. But, you know, it took us what? R22 was finally formally banned in, in, in use in, like last year, and th so what, that was 30 years from, from when the Montreal Protocol was signed, so it's gonna be a little while. Well, but you have to figure that into the cost as well, because if I have an R22 unit, getting mm -hmm. that service is probably gonna be crazy expensive, right? I mean, any of the systems that we're gonna be installing now, the system longevity of them, in my opinion, is gonna be outside of the longevity and in replacement mode before 410 is everything. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if we're projecting that a ductless split system is going to last 18 to 20 years, we're not going to see 410 gone in 18 to 20 years. I mean, when they formally, like you said, when they formally. Do you need to service an R22 unit? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you can. Oh, yeah. yeah. So like you, can, you can do it for existing. R12, but you can, yeah. Right. No, but R22, basically, what they did is when they held on, there's no more manufacturing of it. So we can still purchase it. Um, and then they actually went further a couple of years ago. They used that dry charge condenser. They skirted it. They would send you an empty condenser with a bottle of our, and so they're skirting how that's out too. Um, but no, there still is our 22 on the market um, because we reclaim it and they buy, buy it back um, basically at that point. Um, so it's still serviceable. Not recommended to do any major repairs. Um, Cost-wise, it wouldn't make sense. And like, what we're talking about with the compressor, if I'm putting 10 pounds of refrigerant, at $100 a pound. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a slow transition and, and just because, you know, you, you'll start to have, whenever the kind of successor is identified, you're going to need to start, manufacturers will need to start, you know, changing their equipment around that. Then I think there's kind of the slow, slow piece of, you know, there's going to be a base of contractors that are still servicing and installing 410 and will slowly be learning, learning sort of what, what are the cha new practices for the successor, and that's not something that's going to happen overnight. That's that's you know, frankly, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't see it happening in for you know, a couple of decades. Well, so systems that we're putting in today, like you know, Ma you know, Mass Massachusetts assumes their last, they like you know, utilities assume they last 18 years. Like I think 18 years from now, we'll have a lot of new systems going in with the successor refrigerant that doesn't have the same uh, emissions potential, but we'll still have a lot of legacy equipment that, um, you know, we're servicing that equipment is still a substantial base of work for a lot of people. If I put a, if I put a uh, hydronic boiler in, natural gas boiler in, or whatever kind of boiler in, I know that I can still burn that fuel in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I put in a heat pump, I don't, I'm not sure that there's going to be electricity in 20 years? Or no, refrigerant. I mean, I, I well, again, we're saying, it, it, it wouldn't matter either way they make drop-ins. So like for R22, if they were to say R22, you're no longer allowed to buy or purchase or do anything with it, they make a synthetic drop-in for it. So it's, it's just like anything. Um, you know, if, if you were to worry if all of a sudden that they don't make synthetic motor oil in 10 years, they're going to make some version that would adapt to that. So like with R22, they have all, and they have MO, they have all sorts of refrigerants that are dropping. So even if tomorrow 410A was 100% banned, they'll make a synthetic refrigerant that will operate as if it was 410A. And that's what they do with R22 now anyway. So you can do 12, 1.4A, you can do any of them. Yeah. And like, like Jeremy said, I, the, the two that they're testing with that I've mainly heard them testing with is the next one is the CO2. Um, they want to see if they can run it off of that. And, and pro, the other one that there's a company in Europe that's trying to manufacture them right now is they run off propane. Um, so they don't know where they're going with the next refrigerant at this point in time, um, but they'll make drop-ins for ever. If you wanted to put refrigerant in a 40-year-old R22 unit, I wouldn't recommend it, but you could. Um, they'll make a drop-in for it. I guess just to then to that, it's worth noting what your point that you'd be able to burn gas then. I mean, it's probably unlikely that it'll be banned, but the policy environment you know, goes along and maybe a lot less, you know, if there's carbon pricing or whatever, maybe a lot less uh, economically uh, attractive to be burning natural gas in 20 years than it is now, too. So. I mean, you know, the, 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 to be fair, a lot of. Away from fossil fuels so rapidly or uh, so rapidly that. 
um, with things moving away from fossil fuels uh, and moving more towards renewables, you expect the cost of fossil fuels to start going down, yeah. right? So, I, which is fine. <coughs> Well, I mean, you, you look at something like, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, mass New York, a lot of these states are taking aim at, you know, the delivered fuels first because that's where the cost effectiveness is, is like, you know, what, you know, where, where's the oil technician market 20 years from now uh, is, is, I think actually, a, a, you know, to me is a potentially the more <laughs> pressing question than where's, where's the service, where are the service technicians for a particular type of refrigerant? Uh, because if, you know, that, market share has been eroding to gas conversions and others for dec for you know over a decade now and now add in add in you know electrification as another component to that you you're going to start seeing less and less of that and as we've seen um you know oil you know while you know oil is obviously a global commodity and you know how that pricing pricing goes oil boilers and furnaces have increased in cost by i think something like 60 like 50 percent or so over the last 20 years because they're not manufacturing them as much so you, you, you know, it's, it's going to be a complicated question. <laughs> um, all right, any, uh, any last questions? Yeah, go ahead, Alan. My last one is, is um, yeah. it's a concern for a lot of us in New England, is that if there's a power failure, our system could go out and our house could freeze and disaster could strike. And I, I guess that applies to maybe any heating system. Correct. Have, have you heard of any power pack? I'm thinking especially for a mini split or something might take a little less power. Mm -hmm. Any kind of a affordable power pack that you could have wired in so that if the power fails, your house doesn't freeze? I mean, you know, you can always size a backup generator to that. I don't know if I would, you know, recommend it for a whole home system, uh, just given the size of the generator you would need. And so you can, you can do it if you don't need to size it for the whole home. Just look at what's crazy with the generator. The fact is, you only need to keep the pipe just crazy. Yep. And you know, so you size that for yep. that much. Um, I, th I think for, for a cost-effective wise, you're better off with a really small generator and space heaters at that point. I mean, otherwise you're putting in you're putting in a 20 kW. I mean, let's put it this way: I have sole source, from, and I, I live in Southern New Hampshire, and that's my sole source of heat for the whole entire house. I have no backup. I don't have a generator that's going to run that because even for the amount of time that it would. I mean, I have a telescope, so I, I guess I mean in for my garage, only for my garage, but you could. You could run space heaters off of a small portable generator that has dirty power. Yeah. A lot more effective than a twenty thousand dollar. So a small generator would be a more likely cost benefit. Yeah. 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 I did two. I did over two hundred homes last year in mini splits on these, and probably forty of them were full home, and one person put in a generator. Just the cost wise. Yeah. Well, great. Everyone, thanks so much for uh, taking time out of your day to join us. And if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to send them along. <clears throat>